Hello, everyone. My name is Donna Hagiga, and I am the CEO of the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. And we're so pleased that you could be with us today for this discussion of peace, power, and prosperity for women and girls, 25 years on from the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, China. A little bit about the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. We are almost 24 years old, and we have been advancing gender equity for women and girls in the four counties of Western Massachusetts for that long, making grants and running leadership programs as well. Our priorities are around economic security for women and girls, freedom from violence, parity in positions of power, and nurturing a diverse and inclusive nonprofit community serving women and girls in our region. So welcome to Peace, Power, and Prosperity for Women and Girls again. And we have folks joining us from around the country and even internationally today. So we're so excited to have you with us. Our co-host for this event is Berkshire Community College, which is located in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. We wanna take a moment right now to recognize our power sponsors for this leadership series and for their leadership. And they are Berkshire Bank, Greylock Federal Credit Union, Game Changers 360, and we also want to thank our peace sponsors for their support. And they are Greenfield College, Greenfield Community College, the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts founders, which include Diane Fuller Doherty, the late Sally Livingston, and Martha Richards, and Social Mission Catalysts LLC. So thank you to all of our sponsors for making today possible. You're probably wondering if you're tuning in from around the country or around the world, why a women's fund in Western Massachusetts would want to put on a global event talking about the global impact of, you know, the last 25 years. Well, it's actually part of our origin story. You see our three founders, Diane, Sally, and Martha, had attended the Beijing World Conference on Women, and that was really the gestation period for what became the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. So we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to reflect on the anniversary of the Beijing conference and see where women have gotten to uh, since 25 years ago and that amazing conference in Beijing. So today we have gathered uh, with us some global experts and a regional expert as well to talk about how women have fared over the last 25 years. We're really lucky to have with us today uh, Dr. Valerie Hudson, who is a Univer university distinguished professor and she holds the George H.W. Bush Chair in the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, where she directs the program of Women, Peace and Security. Hudson is one of the principal investigators of the Women's Stat Project. She's also an author and you'll hear more about that later. Welcome, Valerie. Very nice to be here. Thank you very much. Great. We also have with us today Dr. Silka Staub. Sil Dr. Staub is a research specialist at UN Women New York and is the co-author of several of the organization's flagship reports, including Progress of the World's Women and most recently and relevantly for our conversation, Women's Rights in Review 25 Years After Beijing. Before joining UN Women, Silka worked as a researcher for different UN agencies and non-governmental organizations. Welcome, Silka. Thank you, Donna. Really glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Great. And finally, rounding out our uh, group today is Dr. Kathleen Zegda. Kathleen is the Director of Community Research and Evaluation at the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts, and Dr. Zegda has over 20 years of public health and research experience working at the national, state, and local levels at the U.S. Centers for D Disease Control, excuse me, Disease Control and Prevention, and other research institutions. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Donna. I'm happy to be here. I am really excited for this conversation, and I wanted to share with our, our viewers who are uh, tuning in that you can uh, put your questions, any questions that you might have for any of our speakers in the question and answer box, and the chat function is more for comments that you might like to make or any questions that you might have in terms of audio or, or video and that sort of thing. So um, we welcome your questions. We are going to have a question and answer period after our discussion. 
So do use that question and answer box and we will be looking at it and try to get to as many of your questions as we can. And so without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Valerie first. Uh, Valerie as a peace and security expert, uh, 25 years is quite a long time. Can you share with us uh, your view on how women have fared over these last 25 years? Yes, I can as soon as I figure out how to unmute while in slideshow. I think I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you see the slideshow? Are we good? All right, wonderful. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you today. A shout out to uh, this wonderful organization and their sponsors who are uh, putting it on. Uh, what a wonderful break from our pandemic world to be able to um, reflect on these important issues. Uh, so uh, when I was asked to sort of say, well, kind of what's changed uh, over the last uh, 25 years. Um, I just want to say that uh, I was in a good position to do it. I'm a co-PI on the Women's Stats Project. If you're not familiar with that database, go to womenstats.org. Uh, we have very good coverage from 95 to the present on the situation of women in 176 countries, those with at least 300,000 population. And so we have a wide variety of phenomena that you can look at, and uh, there are maps, color maps, all sorts of things. So you might find that a resource if you're interested. And uh, I'm also speaking on the heels of publishing a book with uh, two co-authors called The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. And so uh, some of what I'm speaking about today comes from that book, but uh, if you're interested in, in reading more, um, have at it. I would love to hear your feedback. Okay, um, why would we be interested in the situation of women? Um, well, obviously they're human beings and we are definitely interested in the state of women for just that reason. But there are also very important links um, that our recent book has shown. Uh, this, what's going on with women, whether they're being subordinated and oppressed, has a lot to do with national security and the dimensions thereof. Food and security and malnutrition. Uh, women often have the gendered task of making sure um, that uh, they and children and the elderly are fed. And uh, if you disempower uh, those who provide food for the household, you will end up with food insecurity, which is exactly what you end up with. Demographic problems are exacerbated uh, by the suppression uh, of women. We even found in our research that poor governance was tightly connected with the subordination of women. That is to say, if uh, every household in the land uh, is in a sense a tiny little autocracy with women being subordinated in that system, well, that's exactly what you get at the nation state level. It seems completely normal. Uh, and any, any other system would seem really abnormal. So corrupt, autocratic, ineffective governments are often what we see. We did find strong links to uh, conflict um, that when um, subordination, even violence against women is prevalent, you see the nation state involved in a lot more conflict than otherwise. Far worse morbidity and mortality because women are often gendered as the healthcare takers for their families. And so if you disempower them, uh, don't be surprised if you get worse health outcomes. And lastly, something that was very interesting to me is our research in our book showed that there is a, a strong um, a relationship between the subordination of women and worse economic performance on virtually any indicator that you would like to see. So that's why this, uh, is, this discussion is important, not just for those who love women, but for anyone who loves uh, their nation. Uh, what's going on with women will absolutely affect that. So before we start delving into the um, particulars of gender trends, I just wanted to point out that um, what I have found in my studies is that positive gender trends are easily reversible. They can reverse overnight. And we saw this uh, in the Arab uprising, where in several Arab uprising nations, um, hard-won gains for women were reversed just like that. Um, on the other hand, 
significant progress for women seems to take 10 or more years. It takes almost, you know, the full passing of a generation before you can get substantive um, uh, durable change for women. All right, so if we were looking from 95 or 2000 to the present, what's getting better, what's getting worse, and what's kind of staying the same? Well, in terms of what's getting better, probably the most amazing thing that is getting better is that we have seen an overall reduction, about a 45% reduction in maternal mortality over that time period. Um, but don't get too excited because virtually all of that reduction is coming from one nation, which is China. So we still have places uh, such as in West Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa and so forth where maternal mortality rates are still uh, obscenely high. Uh, but nevertheless, we have a 45% reduction and that's worth um, being very happy about. Second, we also see a virtual parity in primary school uh, enrollment for boys and girls. Uh, uh, in 1995, there were severe discrepancies between the number of girls going to primary school and the number of boys going to primary school. We don't see that anymore. The enrollment rates are about uh, 97 girls per 100 boys worldwide are going to school. And we do not see the huge interregional variation that we did before. Now, enrollment is not completion, however. And so primary school completion and then following on to that, secondary school enrollment and completion uh, are far from perfect and still show a uh, significant bias against girls. Uh, but at least we've made a huge um, step forward in terms of primary school enrollment. Um, in terms of the representation of women, we do see a significant increase in that representation. Uh, at the uh, turn of the century in January 20, 2000, um, the global representation of women in national legislatures was 13%. And now it's a bit over 24%, which is almost but not quite a doubling. And in some regions, we see a very high percentage of women in decision-making uh, position in legislatures, and uh, 44% in the Nordic countries. Now, again, uh, you know, one might say, well, heck, uh, <laughs> still shy of 25%. We don't even have, you know, uh, one quarter uh, of our legislators being women. We would like to see at least one half. Uh, being women. But nevertheless, an almost doubling of that um, is noteworthy. Uh, other things that are getting better is we're seeing changes in law. Um, for example, most of the countries that had uh, what we call, um, uh, what had underage marriage um, fine for girls, um, we have seen um, major legal reform in that area. Um, in fact, um, uh, the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa had a, an OAU pledge to in, increase the legal age of marriage for girls to 18. Lots of progress on the legal front. But as you can imagine, enforcement seriously, seriously lags. So in some of those countries where the legal age of marriage for girls is 18, we still see 60, 70 percent of girls being married by the age of 16. Uh, so a, a long ways to go there. Uh, we also see across the world, marry your rapist laws are being dropped uh, one by one. Uh, and, and these are laws that allow a, a rapist to um, escape punishment if they marry or at least offer to marry the girl that they have raped. Those laws are going away. And we also see a significant increase in countries with laws against domestic violence. Um, in 1995, at uh, the time of the Beijing conference, only 15 nations had um, specific laws against domestic violence, and now over 144 do today. But as you can imagine, enforcement lags. What's getting worse? Well, one of the things that's getting worse is actually the sex ratio of the world. Uh, in an unmanipulated population, there should be about 98 men per 100 women, because women live longer than men. But the current global sex ratio is now at least 101.8 men per 100 women. When I first started studying sex ratios in 1990, there were only five nations with abnormal birth sex ratios, and two of them were Hong Kong and Macau, which were still uh, independent entities at that time. But now there's at least 18, and those include things like Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, China and Hong Kong, Georgia, India, Kosovo, Latvia, Lebanon, 
Montenegro, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Serbia, Taiwan, Vanuatu, and Vietnam. So we're seeing a spreading as well as a deepening of sex ratio abnormality. We also see it incident to huge migrant waves. Um, the first wave of migration is almost always young adult men. So when that first big wave of migration hit Europe in 2015, Sweden opened its doors. And they also said that if you were under 18, you would never be deported for any reason. So they had a huge influx of young men who were claiming to be 16 and 17. And so in 2016, when the Swedes counted their population, they found that the, the ratio among the 16 and 17 year olds was 123 men per 100 women, uh, which was very stunning because these, the um, ratio for the same age population in China is only 117 men per 100 women uh, in that country. So that's a big concern. Um, are women's rights ebbing? Are they under attack? Absolutely. There, um, certainly in post-Arab uprising nations, uh, with the possible exception of Tunisia, Turkey has seen uh, a rollback in women's rights. It's interesting to see how authoritarianism and the rollback of women's rights just go hand in hand in country after country. In Central Asia and the Caucasus, we see the same. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, there's been a strong push to re-legalize polygamy. Uh, which was outlawed during the Soviet time. Uh, and, and, and so this is deeply troubling. Even in my own nation of the United States, I think we're seeing um, some regression as well in terms of women's reproductive rights. What seems not to be changing? Um, troublingly, uh, what not, what's not changing is the high levels of violence against women that we see worldwide. In the, in the country with the lowest amount of violence against women, one in five women have experienced violence, particularly in the home. Uh, and this is in times of both war and times of peace. That's the best we seem to be able to do as a human uh, species at the moment. Um, but there are places where it's far worse. There are countries in which almost 90% of women have experienced violence. So this has been something about which we have not made much progress as humankind. And then lastly, there still remain some inequitable laws, uh, for example, title to land uh, and title to valuable property. Still worldwide, uh, that favors men. Rights and marriage in many societies are still dictated by customary and religious law that afford women lesser rights. In some countries, women are still viewed as legal minors and must have a male guardian for uh, virtually anything of importance in their life. And of course, reproductive decision making is something that is still um, biased against women in many countries. So some of the questions this raises for me is, you know, what's, what are gonna, what's gonna be the effect of things like an increasingly masculinized global sex ratio or of migration waves? Um, I want to understand the linkage um, between uh, autocracy and women's rights. And I want to understand why women's rights are ebbing and why. And why are women's rights the first things to be swept away? And I want to understand how it is that we can progress so well on things like primary school enrollment while regressing so badly on things such as sex selective abortion and female infanticide. How can that be happening at the same time? Um, so to conclude, I'd just like to say that I really think that um, it's clear, I think, that women's insecurity undermines the security of the entire collective, whether that be defined at the community level, the nation state level, or the global level. I think Hillary Clinton said it best in 2012 when she was Secretary of State, when she said, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and to the national security of our country. Sometimes people say to me, ah, Professor Hudson, you know, what's going on with women, that's just you know, a symptom of, of something deeper and bigger, such as a lack of democracy or of poverty or of resource scarcity. But the longer I've studied these issues, the more I realize that they have it reversed, right? That um, it is actually the character of male-female relations within the society, that's the big deal. 
And the canaries that are squawking and falling over are things like ill health, conflict, poor governance, demographic insecurity, uh, and so forth and so on. So we need to get that right. And um, I think that we can have a great conversation about this. And I look forward to um, that discussion in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. And I wanna invite everyone who's listening to please, uh, if you have questions specifically for Valerie or on all that great information she just covered, please go ahead to uh, type it into the question and answer box. And uh, Valerie, I just wanna comment that I think one thing that I've just learned from your presentation is that I can no longer say unequivocally that we as women are the majority and yet we're treated like a minority. Uh, so thank you for that uh, amongst all the other information that you shared. And now I'd like to turn uh, to Silka. Silka as the co-author of the UN report on uh, Beijing plus 25 or you know, looking at uh, the 25 year span since the uh, conference, uh, I'd love to have you share from the UN's perspective uh, what has transpired and how women, have, women and girls have fared over the last 25 years. Sure, thank you. Let me unmute myself first and then try and share my screen. Um, Sorry, let me try that again. Here we go. All right. Okay, I think here we are. Can everybody see? All right. Um, so thanks so much and thanks to Valerie as well for this really, really comprehensive overview. Um, your presentation resonates really strongly with the findings of um, the report um, that we launched earlier this year um, on International Women's Day, right before um, all of New York and most of the world went into lockdown before um, because of COVID-19 and the Commission on the Status of Women, which um, meets regularly every year in March, was suspended. Um, so I'm happy to be able to um, reshare those findings today with you as well. Um, the report is entitled Women's Rights in Review 25 Years After Beijing. It's really a summary of a much larger exercise that UN Women um, conducts every five years to review progress, gaps, and challenges in the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action, which remains the most, one of the most important global frameworks, in addition to CEDAW, um, on women's rights and gender equality at the global level. Um, and it draws on the latest global statistics, but it also draws on 160 national reports that were submitted by governments from around the world and where they themselves reflect on key gender equality trends um, in their respective countries. So based on the findings of this report, I would like to complement Valerie's um, presentation with three main messages. The first is that really the context today is quite a different one from 1995 when the platform was adopted. The second is, and Valerie has already um, made that clear, that progress for women is really fragile and uneven. Um, we see positive trends in some areas, while we see stagnation and reversal in others. And I won't go over the details of these areas any longer because we've seen them in the previous presentation. What I do want to shine a bit of a spotlight on is that in addition, there are also persistent inequalities among women across countries, to be sure, but also within each and every country based on things like income, ethnicity, race, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, and so on. And finally, I want to zoom in a little bit on economic inequality and the persistent barriers to women's economic empowerment that are also likely to be exacerbated as a result of the current pandemic. 
So I want to start with a brief reflection of the overall context and how in 2020 we're really at quite a different and, and in some ways less hopeful conjuncture than in 1995. The 1995 Beijing conference came at a high water mark of democracy and multilateralism and in particular it came on the heels of the second wave of democratization, particularly in Latin America and Eastern Europe. And in this context, gender equality advocates were really quite optimistic about the role that democratic states could play in changing discriminatory laws, policies, and practices. The idea of gender mainstreaming that received a major push at the Beijing conference is um, an embodiment of that hope in a way. And of course, gender equality advocates have successfully pushed for changes, sweeping changes in laws, for example, as Valerie has already mentioned. But at the same time, new challenges have arisen that make it much more difficult, um, I think, um, to expand and deepen these achievements, to turn laws into lived realities for women and girls um, across the globe. And so some of these new challenges include rising economic inequality and the widespread sense that the gains of development and growth have not been shared equally. Um, a number of conflict and humanitarian crises that are not only more complex and more protracted, but also have to, are taking a huge toll on women and girls. The climate emergency that has clearly exacerbated um, since 1995 and has already a negative impact on the poorest women and girls. Um, democratic erosions and rising authoritarianism um, that were mentioned, including in some of the regions that were the great hopefuls in 1995, like Latin America and Eastern Europe. And as Valerie already said, these then really go hand in hand with the associated um, pushback against some hard-won women's rights gains, but also broader gains in human rights or the whole notion of human rights, really. And that's also something that we see playing out in the, multi in the multilateral spaces, um, including the Commission on the Status of Women, where at a time when really global cooperation is needed the most, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, right? Some of the most powerful governments appeal to national sovereignty and actively seek to impede further progress on global gender equality norms. So that's the context. Another important caveat that must be added to any narrative about global um, progress is that global, regional, and, and even national averages sometimes conceal more than they reveal. Progress for women is not automatically progress for all women. And so let's take the case of Colombia here. Colombia is a country that has made significant strides in terms of reducing maternal mortality, providing women with better access to health, et cetera, really quite good development of indicators since 1995. And if we look at the national average for access to um, a skilled health professional during childbirth, um, the, the proportion of women who lacks that access is relatively low at 4%. Um, but when we start looking at particular groups of women, those who face multiple intersecting inequalities and disadvantages based on income, based on geographic location or on ethnicity or race, we see that that proportion rises sharply to 33%. That's eight times the national average. So there are real pockets um, of deprivation where kind of multiple inequalities intersect to create compounding disadvantages. And we see similar trends here on the screen for or some similar dynamics for um, early marriage rates and adolescent pregnancy rates, where the rates for poor Afro-descendant women in rural areas are, are, are more than twice the national average. And um, I thought it's worth mentioning that such compounding inequalities are not restricted to developed countries, of course. They also exist in, in developed countries, highly developed countries, such as the United States. And I think Kathleen's going to speak a bit more um, about those. But I did want to mention that for a 2018 report, we looked um, at health insurance access in the United States and found that among Hispanic women from low income households, um, the rate of those lacking access to health insurance was 10 times as high as among high-income white women. Um, so 
and and I think you know the the pandemic has really driven that point home and really made painfully clear how um, these these inequalities intersect. Um, one area that I wanted to delve in a bit more um, and where we've seen signs of stagnation amidst new uncertainties is women's economic security and autonomy. So when we look at female labor force participations globally and across regions, what we see is that the gender gap in labor force participation rates among prime working age adults has stagnated since 1998. So over the past 20 years, it stands at 31 percentage points globally. And you see on the left-hand side, probably, or right-hand side for you, a uh, right-hand side of the screen, um, um, that more than 90% of men, men are in the global labor force compared to 63% of women. There are interesting variations of, across regions. So Latin America is the region that has seen the strongest increase in women's labor force participation, particularly in the 1990s. But now um, the rates in the last years um, have slowed down significantly. The counterpart to that is really Central and Southern Asia, where we see a decline in already really, really low labor force participation rates among women from 36 to 34%. And the other example I wanted to mention is Sub-Saharan Africa, where we see generally high rates of female labor force participation and gender gaps that are similar to the developed countries, really. But what's important to bear in mind here is that the bulk of women's work in these contexts is not remunerated. It's work, it's unpaid family labor in small family farms or family businesses. So really with very little economic empowerment potential. In high-income countries, such as the U.S., the female labor force participation is relatively high. It's somewhat caught up with men's, but there's, there's still gaps. And we also know, of course, that there are persistent gender pay gaps. And so I wanted to just say a few words about some of the things that make these gaps so stubborn um, across regions. And family dynamics are a huge part of that. What we see is that even where women's participation in paid employment has increased, this has not been matched by a commensurate increase in men's participation in unpaid care and domestic work. Globally, women still do three times as much of this work as men. And this also means that marriage and motherhood continue to have a significant negative impact on women's employment across most regions, while interestingly have the opposite effect for men. So fathers and, and married men are more likely to be in the labor force than um, single childless men. Well, for, for women, the reverse pattern holds. For the United States in particular, this pattern of the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus, as Michelle Budik calls it, um, has also been documented for labor market earnings. So what happens when um, men become fathers is that they receive a significant boost in their earnings and the wage increase is largest for men at the top of the earnings pyramid. While when women become mothers, they usually take a pay cut and the cut is deepest for women at the bottom of the earnings pyramid. Um, that is those who can least afford it. So what I want to get at with this is that there is a legacy and a rigidity in domestic and caregiving responsibilities that continues to work to women's disadvantage and that without decided action um, is likely being exacerbated by, by the current pandemic. So one may ask, um, aren't things getting better for the next generation of women? And well, here too, um, the picture is not so straightforward. So we see that, for example, worldwide, 30% of young women, 15 to 24, are not in education, employment, or training compared to 13% of men. So there are still stark gaps in continued schooling, as Valerie has already said, but and also in school to work transitions in adolescence. Um, and that is compounded again by other factors such as disabilities. So um, in the, ra the, the rates of young women with disabilities who are not in education, employment, or training range widely between countries, but they're usually higher than those of young men with disabilities and also those of young women without disabilities. 
So a compound, one, one of these other compound disadvantages. So I wanted to close um, because um, this whole picture has been, um, has been probably quite depressing with a few um, potential silver linings. Um, and the first is, um, I think that in many areas, we do have the evidence and we know what policies can make a difference. We know, for example, that poverty among single mothers and older, older women is significantly lower in countries with strong social security systems and with generous work family conciliation policies, such as subsidized childcare and paid parental leave. Those leaves can include daddy quotas for men, and that has then been shown as well that it increases men's participation in unpaid care and domestic work in the home. The second silver lining is that many countries have in fact taken positive steps in the right direction. So in the, in the review we did in 2019, 2020, 128 countries reported to have introduced or strengthened maternity, paternity, or parental leave over the past five years. And we've also seen several countries in Latin America, including Chile, Ecuador, and Uruguay, that have made important strides in increasing childcare coverage through free or subsidized childcare services, often catching up quite rapidly with developed countries um, that have low rates of coverage. And then last but not least um, is the renewed rise and vibrancy of social movements, often with women and young women at the helm. And these movements are not only, as we, we see every day, resisting rollbacks and attacks on women's rights, but also pushing for more radical changes. From the Fridays of Future um, movements in Europe to young women in Africa who are resisting extractivism um, and so on, there's a challenge to unsustainable patterns of consumption and production, um, especially among young people and young women. We've seen racial justice movements um, gaining strength um, in the US and elsewhere. And in Latin America, as elsewhere as well, um, the women's movement has really been very strong when it comes to violence. In Latin America, the Ni Una Menos movement has built really strong alliances um, to demand action on violence and femicide in particular, but also challenged economic security caused by debt crises and, and austerity. Because we know that the violence against women policies will never be effective if they're not backed by, by adequate funding. So I'll leave you on this slightly more positive note um, and hope that you check out our report um, for which the link is here and I'm looking forward to the discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silka, for that overview. That was really great. And I look forward to delving into that report even more. We do have a couple of questions that are coming in for Valerie and Silka so far. So I want to encourage folks to do use the question and answer box. And after Kathleen's um, turn, uh, we and a, a quick question, uh, we'll get to your questions and answers. So please do, uh, do use that option to ask your questions, because I'm sure you have them. And Silka, I think one of the things that I heard through your uh, presentation were some themes and some uh, things that I, we saw mirrored here in Western Massachusetts, thanks to research that Kathleen and her team did. So Kathleen, uh, I'd like to turn now to you uh, and sort of, we, we've used a, a wide lens, thanks to Valerie and Silka and their perspective globally, but now let's narrow that lens and say, how have women and girls fared in Western Massachusetts, even if we don't have a, a long perspective of 25 years of data to look at, we do know that you have looked more recently. Give us a snapshot of how women and girls are faring. Thank you. Okay, um, I I've unmuted and let me pull this up. So thank you, Donna. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak about the status of, of girls and young women and women in our region here in Western Massachusetts. So as Donna has mentioned, um, the Women's Fund completed a report in 2013 on the status of women in Western Massachusetts. And we worked with the Women's Fund in an advisory group comprised of um, experts, women from the region, 
to create a report to update the findings um, at, um, from the 2013 report. So we did that in 2019 and the Women's Fund created this um, key findings report. And you'll see as I go through and, and talk about um, some of the findings from that report in some of the different areas, similar to what we've heard from Silka and Valerie that um, progress has been made and as we all know more is needed but I also just want to and we'll touch on that there is great work going on in our region to support these efforts and it's so important that the Women's Fund commissions these reports so that we can understand um, what the areas are and status of women in our region so that we can take action. So as I speak to um, to the progress that has been made, similar to what Silka was discussing. It's important to examine um, among women where that progress is taking place and where it, it's not or where it lags far behind. And you'll see from what I discussed that um, women and girls of color continue to experience large inequities and we don't have data um, for other areas where um, we know that there are inequities as well, for example, among women with disabilities and other areas, but we know that, as Silka was saying, that these things intersect. And as we do, it's important to keep in, in mind as well the societal structures that contribute to these inequities, such as um, institutional and systemic racism and other drivers. This is an image from the King County Office of Equity and Social De Justice that talks about um, and shows the um, determinants of equity and really the importance of creating opportunity in so many different ways to to be able to um, foster um, progress and that women can achieve and, and people can achieve um, their fullest potential and it includes things such as quality education healthy environments safe neighborhoods job opportunities and career pathways and other areas that are important to consider as well so um, before I talk about some of the different areas um, that we I focused on and identified in our report, um, I just wanted to touch briefly on our region as a whole and who the women are in our region to give some context to some of the difference we may see across the counties. Um, Western Mass is a very diverse region. We have the Springfield metropolitan area based in Hamden County, but also a number of rural areas throughout Western Massachusetts, including the Hilltowns and the Berkshires. And the difference in these communities bring um, different benefits and unique benefits to the women and girls who reside in them from the natural beauty of the more rural hills of the Berkshires and Hilltowns to the diverse racial and ethnic cultural vibrancy of Springfield. And there's also different types of challenges that women experience um, related to access to services and economic and educational challenges or barriers. And it's important to keep this all in mind as, as we start to examine differences across the counties and start to see um, where women um, in some counties may be experiencing more challenges. So, um, as we look across Western Mass, and women make up approximately 50% of the population in Western Massachusetts, um, the region it has diverse representation with 26% women of color. And we see more diversity in Hamden County, which um, where approximately 50% um, of women in Western Massachusetts reside. And so in that county, 37% um, are women of color and much less diversity in some of our more rural counties, such as Franklin County, where approximately 8% are women of color. Amongst women of color, um, Latinas make up the, the greatest proportion, 16% um, of women in Western Mass, followed by Black women who make up approximately 5% of women. So, how, as we examine how women are faring, I'll start with education. And um, over time, we've seen more women and girls um, completing higher levels of education. And we are also seeing that women and girls, um, as we look at the data now, are completing higher levels of education in Western Massachusetts um, than men and males. 
Um, in regards overall to girls in high school, we are seeing um, somewhat lower high school dropout rates, and we're seeing more girls um, and young women who are taking more college placement exams and advanced placement tests in Western Massachusetts. Um, however, they are, we are seeing lower scores on these tests, so just an area um, to be aware of. When we look at edu educational attainment overall across Western Massachusetts, we can see that the rates vary across counties. So this is a chart that shows educational attainment among males and females by county. And you can see that um, purple are people who have completed bachelor's degree or higher, and green is completed some college or associate's degree. So um, women are completing higher rates of um, bachelor's degree or higher across all four counties than men, and even some college or associate's degree, um, ranging from the highest rates in Hampshire and Hamden County, or Hampshire and Franklin County, I'm sorry, of 40% or higher, um, and lower rates among um, women who reside in, in Berkshire and Hamden County, approximately 30%. As we turn and look at um, labor force and employment and earnings, um, women in Western Massachusetts, approximately 75% are in the labor force, and that's comparable to what it was in the 2013 report. When we look and see how that translates to income, um, similar and as discussed by Silka to the wage gap in persistent wage gap in the United States as a whole, um, we see that overall in Western Massachusetts, women earned 83%, 83 cents to every man's dollar. And that's pretty much um, comparable across counties in Western Massachusetts as a whole. And this gap persisted even when taking into account education with women with equivalent education to men earning less across education levels. The greatest gap was among women with lower levels of education, so women with a high school degree or equivalent, and they earn from 55 cents to 68 cents per men's dollar across Western Massachusetts counties. And it persisted, though, through among women who had a graduate or professional degree, um, where women earned 74 cents to 83 cents for every dollar earned by men with a graduate or professional degree in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts. These inequities were even greater among women of color. And so here you can see um, by county um, the, uh, how much women earned um, of, um, by race and ethnicity compared to white men in their county. And you can see the largest gap was among um, black and African American women in each county with the largest, you can see a 59 cent gap in Franklin County. Um, among black women, it ranged from 41 cents to 63 cents um, to each white man's dollar earned across the Western Mass counties. And among Latinas, 46 cents to 64 cents earned. So um, much larger inequities um, amongst women of color. We also um, examined um, leadership in higher education and healthcare, which are two of the largest employment sectors in our region. And we found underrepresentation in both of these areas. So um, in regards to higher education, there was a study done in Massachusetts um, by the Power Gap that looked at comprehensive gender leadership. And in the study, 16 institutions, higher education institutions were included from Western Massachusetts. So, among the, um, they were ranked among the institutions included in Massachusetts as a whole, and four of the top 10 in Massachusetts um, for comprehensive gender leadership were found in Western Massachusetts. So we have some institutions that are, are doing a good job with gender parity and leadership. Um, among those Western Massachusetts included, six of the 16 were found to be less than sa satisfactory for um, comprehensive gender leadership. Um, which included both um, less than satisfactory and needs improvement. 
So when looking as a whole at presidents in um, these institutions, we saw that less than half, 44%, were female in 2017 and 2018. We also did an analysis of healthcare institutions and found that among the largest healthcare systems in Western Massachusetts, um, at least 41%, but less than 50% of the leadership were, um, were women. And so um, we're seeing, again, underrepresentation, though closer to 50%. We saw um, greater underrepresentation amongst female business owners in Western Massachusetts with only 31% of businesses owned by women. And even greater um, disproportionate representation in STEM with women making up only 28% of the STEM workforce in Western Mass. So as we look at health and well-being, I just wanted to um, point out that all of the various things that I've discussed related to economics and others um, really impact health as a whole. And so this is an image um, of the social determinants of health framework. And it really illustrates that where we live, work, and the social, economic, and political environment contribute to health and our opportunities to be healthy. And as I talk a little bit about health, keeping in mind that these also drive some of the inequities that we're seeing in health um, as well. So when we examine health and safety, um, a few areas were identified um, amongst a number for um, focus for women. And so mental health was one of these areas. And so when you look at um, studies, um, women are at higher risk for depression compared to men. Um, studies have estimated a, a lifetime prevalence of 20 to 25 percent, which is double that of men. We don't have data overall for women in Western Massachusetts, but when we looked at data among girls in Western Massachusetts from school surveys, um, the Prevention Needs Assessment Survey, we found that approximately 50 percent of girls were at high risk for depression, which was um, about double that of boys. And when we looked at LGBTQ plus students, um, it was even higher. And so, for example, in Franklin County, 70% um, of LGBTQ plus students were at risk, high risk for depression. In our most recent youth health survey, which we conduct here in Springfield, um, amongst eighth graders, 40% of LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus students um, had considered depression or suicide in the previous year. So alarmingly high numbers. Sexual violence was another area um, identified in our report. So in Massachusetts and um, comparable to that of the US as a whole, um, it's estimated that 34% of women have experienced contact sexual violence. There's data challenges for collecting data across Western Massachusetts as a whole, so we don't have that number um, in estimates for Western Mass. However, um, available data from the FBI crime reports have found that um, reported rapes in Western Massachusetts are higher than in Massachusetts as a whole with 20% of rapes being reported um, in Western Massachusetts, an area which is um, comprised of 12% of the population in Massachusetts. And another area that was identified um, in the report uh, um, as a need for focus is reproductive and sexual health. And so in some of our counties in, in Western Mass, there are high rates of teen pregnancies and um, sexually transmitted infections, um, particularly in Hamden County. And then also challenges with um, obtaining adequate prenatal care as well. And we, inequities were observed among girls and women of color. And we know that there are numerous um, systemic um, in institutional barriers that um, uh, impact girls and women in these areas and their ability to um, access care and services they need. So as we consider um, political leadership and representation, um, this is an important area of focus. 
um, not only for leadership and decision making for policy and legislation, but also because these are, are women who are visible role model for girls and young women as well. And so we see that again, um, under representation, uh, both at the federal congressional level and in Massachusetts as a whole, and then also in Western Massachusetts amongst the legislature where approximately one third are women. Um, and then also when we look at the local level, we see under representation as a whole. At the time of the report, we looked at mayors from Western Massachusetts and who was female and it was 20%. Um, since then, it's increased to 30% since the last election, 2019. And um, as, as Valerie has mentioned about um, forward progress and that um, going um, there, that fl fluctuates over time, um, I was struck by one of the presenters at the event that the Women's Fund had who, who commented on this from the Berkshires, who is a, a representative, how there was an increase in local representation among women and then a sharp decrease. So again, um, just consistently needing to focus and, and work on representation among women. So as we, we discuss all of the, um, the progress that's been made and the progress that needs to happen still, it's really important to acknowledge and, and understand the efforts and, that are being made to make change in, in our communities here in Western Massachusetts. So um, some of the examples that I wanted to point out are um, efforts to foster leadership, such as the Women's Fund Young Women Advisory Council, which is working on building capacity amongst young women um, to be leaders in these efforts for advocacy. And my colleague, another example who leads um, the Queen's Narrative, which is a group of young women from the Springfield area um, in, form, in fostering leadership efforts. Um, in addition, efforts to create work environments to support women. So at that same Women's Fund event, um, I was struck by and inspired by Pia Kumar, who spoke from Universal Plastics. And she's one of the co-owners. It's um, a business based in Holyoke and the chief of strategy. And she was talking about her very intentional efforts to support the women who work at um, their business, many of whom are single mothers, and some of the policies they put in place um, from on-site childcare to um, shared ridership to leave policies that support the women at their business. And also speaking about it not only supporting their employees, but being good business practice as well. And then also the legislative and policy advocacy that's taking place um, both at statewide level and regional by our Massachusetts and regional commissions on status of women and girls and also the Women's Fund and the work they're doing from Western Massachusetts to raise the importance of um, what's, um, what needs to happen for women and the status in our region. So again, um, these are very important to acknowledge as we talk about the progress that has been made and continues to, um, need, to need to happen in our region as a whole. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That's awesome. Uh, it was a great uh, report on everything that's going on in Western Massachusetts, not just the snapshot of how women and girls are faring, but also what's being done in the region to uh, try to remedy some of the um, things that we don't like that we've seen in that report. So thank you so much for that. And uh, just another reminder to folks to please use the question and answer section to uh, pose any questions you have for Valerie Silka or Kathleen or for all of our uh, speakers today. And I have a question for all of you. I think it would be, uh, we would be remiss uh, not to talk about the effects of COVID. Uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, on the progress that women and girls have made and, ha and what you see might be happening uh, because of uh, COVID. I know one of the slides you shared, Kathleen, was about uh, health and well-being and the determinants of that. And uh, when you were showing that slide, I was just thinking about how so much of that is uh, tied up with uh, COVID as well. So 
let me start with you, Valerie. Uh, any reflections that you have on peace and security and the Women's Stats Project? What are you seeing? How do you think COVID is complicating things? And what do you expect to maybe see in the future? Yeah, well, we've seen a lot. Uh, and I think it's, it's a generalization, but a fairly true generalization that economic desperation um, usually redounds to greater burdens and um, greater vulnerabilities for, for women. So the, the types of things that we're seeing, and again, this depends upon what area of the world you're talking about, is we've already seen uh, an increase in child marriage. Uh, we had been talking about how there were many new laws to prevent that, but economic desperation, particularly in bride price societies, leads people to give their girls away, well, not give their girls, but um, offer their girls in marriage uh, at, at a younger age to garner enough resources to, for the rest of the family um, to survive. Uh, we also see, unsurprisingly, an increase in domestic violence and femicide, um, that economic desperation often leads to violence uh, men have a very gendered role of uh, provider and, um, and often take out economic desperation on those who are dependent on them. Uh, I think depending on the country we're looking at, uh, we've already had reports from, from some countries that um, they're seeing a shortage of contraception and um, uh, family planning uh, tools and, and that this will result in a higher birth rate. Uh, in developed, more developed countries, we're seeing actually sort of a baby bust where fertility rates are actually decreasing. So it's interesting to see sort of um, both at the same time. It's also clearly going to set back women's careers. Uh, women's careers are strongly geared towards the service sector, towards part-time work, towards informal work. And all of this is highly, highly vulnerable uh, in, in this time of economic um, um, gosh, a depression, I think we should probably say. Um, there's already studies that are showing that the poverty gap between men and women is rising in many areas of the world. And lastly, we can't uh, overlook the fact that, um, you know, women have uh, specific preventative health needs um, and preventative health has taken um, a real backseat um, where um, preventative health measures as well as other types of uh, things that are considered to be non-critical care are, are being uh, postponed uh, in, in some cases indefinitely. Uh, and this, I think, uh, has real ramifications, negative ramifications for women. Thanks. Thank you, Valerie. And Silka, from the United Nations perspective, what kind of data are you starting to see? What, what are you expecting to see? Share with us uh, the UN's perspective, please. Yes, I mean, it really also echoes what, what Valerie has said. Um, I think one thing that is really striking about this pandemic is that really we see that men are more affected perhaps by the immediate health impacts as reflected in mortality rates, but that really women and girls bear the brunt of the socioeconomic crisis ramifications of the pandemic. So, you know, women and girls are locked in at home with their abusers and we've seen a rise in, in violence, which is hard to document as well because you can't really do surveys um, in, a, in a context of lockdown. But the data that we've seen comes, for example, from helplines across the world that have seen, you know, the call rates triple, you know, quintuple, et cetera. Um, and this is what UN Women calls the shadow pandemic. And really to people who work on violence against women, this did not come as a surprise um, because we've seen it happen in, in previous crises as well. The other thing that I think is very particular about this crisis is the whole issue around care. So I don't think we have seen in any other crisis before a massive shift of care responsibilities from public institutions into families from literally one day to the next. And we've con we're conducting rapid assessment surveys across countries to find out, you know, who's doing the bulk, who's doing more, who's doing less. And, and um, we've done some now in, in, in a dozen countries across different regions. And, you know, there are some voices who say, oh, isn't this also an opportunity? And there are also some signs really that men are doing more. But, you know, one must also consider if everybody's sitting at home, 
you know, locked in, it would be very strange if men didn't do more. So I think this also has to be seen in the context where women are already doing the bulk of this work. And so obviously the additional help is welcome, but it's not a transformation of gender relations. And finally, we've also seen women being disproportionately affected in many countries as workers in jobs with, with very few labor rights and very few social protections that are really left without you know, income, without livelihoods um, at a much greater rate than men. Um, and with already less cushions in a way to fall back on um, because of pre-existing gender equalities. And so really, I think the pandemic is, is very seriously threatening any progress that we've made so far um, and, and you know, threatens to erase some of that pro, uh, pro, progress. The projections Valerie referred to on poverty show that. What I forgot for what I didn't mention in the presentation before is that we've seen a phenomenal decrease in extreme poverty over the last decades, but poverty still remains feminized and it remains particularly feminized in the reproductive years. Again, the link between kind of family and economic dynamics. And the new projections show that by 2021, 47 million additional women and girls will have been pushed into extreme poverty by the pandemic. And the gender gap in poverty will increase. Um, so I think it's a really, really serious, um, serious situation that, that requires um, action. We're also tracking government actions, just to add that as a final point. And one of the things that that shows is that while there has been really an unprecedented set of social protection and labor market measures to dampen the impact of the crisis, but almost no support for the rising unpaid care burdens at home. And so I think that's a very serious gap that if it's not addressed, also, you know, women will be disproportionately left out of any rec economic recovery that we're going to see. Thank you, Silke. And uh, Kathleen, bringing it home to Western Massachusetts, you mentioned in your presentation that we have a big healthcare sector in this, in this area, and we also have higher education, both uh, industries that have been um, really kind of interrupted uh, by, disrupted, I should say, by this pandemic, and also both places where uh, women, and particularly in the healthcare area, um, are a lot of the workers. Uh, share with us what you are seeing. I know that the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts has uh, introduced a COVID dashboard. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing there. Okay, yeah, um, so along the lines of um, what Valerie and Silka were discussing, we've seen some of that playing out here and we know that our communities are being impacted and women are being impacted. So um, in some of our work in general, some of the food insecurity has become more acute and exacerbated. And when we look at women in, in Western Mass, um, poverty rates range from 12 to 19% of women in Western Massachusetts and are, are higher up to 40% among women of color. And so as we think about um, the challenge, the economic challenges that women have faced um, with uh, the employment and unemployment and the fact that 80% of single parents in Western Massachusetts are women, and they're having to also, as Silko was discussing, caring, care for their children and work and make decisions and choices about and prior, in some way prioritize that. Um, it's a huge struggle. And so I think regarding um, economics and care and childcare, um, it's been really critical. In addition, when we think about um, the workforce in general, and we see that the majority of teachers are women and even childcare providers as well, and, the, um, and needing to be essential workers among childcare providers, um, and then given that women are, many women are primary caregivers, I think that's, that's challenging. Um, so I think there's, there's been a number of challenges that we've seen in our work from economic challenges that clearly felt um, by women. And then um, both in discussions with colleagues and, and people across the region, the challenges with balancing um, childcare and school and a lot of remote schooling happening here um, in Western Massachusetts and people needing to decide whether to um, 
how they're going to arrange that with their jobs and in some cases whether they will keep their jobs um, or have to go part time so right so tough choices being made because of some of this gendered division of labor and the situation with schools and so forth so thank you for that and i think that i've done some reading i know none of you are public health experts per se in terms of like the what people are seeing in the clinical setting but i think one of the things that i've read about is something that they're calling long covid that's affecting women more than men and so i think we may also see some chronic issues with women who have experienced covid uh, so we'll see what that means for women and i hope that uh, public health researchers are gathering data on that because of course if we don't know if we didn't get the data when it was happening it'll be hard to see um, but uh, enough questions or comments from me. We do have some good questions coming in from our attendees, so I want to get to those. And Silka, I think this question probably goes best to you. And it is, can you tell us why the United Nations announced in 1995 that the Beijing uh, Fourth Women's Conference would be the last one uh, that the United Nations was going to sponsor? That's a really um, good question, um, whoever asked it. Um, very important question, too. I don't think it was announced in 1995 that it would be the last World Conference. And in fact, I think there were expectations of having um, a fifth World Conference in 2005 and then again in 2015. Um, I think many feminists and many gender equality advocates would really like to see another conference especially i think those who remember the momentum that was generated there because it was not only an intergovernmental conference that produced the platform there was so much civil society um, action going on and networking and planning and your fund came out of that kind of vibrancy that was created there so I think there, there has been a real um, push for having another one. Um, and, you know, I was 16 at the time. I wasn't in Beijing. I would love to have another world conference that I could actually attend. But at the same time, there have also been voices that are a bit more cautious um, related to some of the contextual changes and challenges that I've referred to earlier and that also Valerie, I think, has touched upon. Um, I, it's not a secret that the influence of conservative forces um, and, you know, forces that are aiming at really a rollback of um, gender equality achievements has grown tremendously, especially since the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, with quite a bit of um, representation or kind of leeway into the multilateral sphere as well through, through, um, through government representation. And so there are also, I think, legitimate concerns that if we open up the Beijing platform, which continues to be such a powerful, you know, platform, I mean, really, when you reread it today, you're... I was struck by how relevant it really still is. If we reopen that up for negotiation, will we actually get something better? Or will we see, you know, sacrifices? Um, because some of these things that, you know, are a mainstay in the, in the Beijing platform have become very contested. So I think there are two, um, you know, there are two sides of that. What UN Women is doing um, in the absence of a fifth world conference for now is, um, and that should have taken place this year and was also a victim of COVID, um, organizing two big gender equality forums that are more, that are bigger multi-stakeholder gatherings, not so focused on the intergovernmental negotiations, but more a gathering of really gender equality advocates and feminists from different um, parts of the world and different spheres of society. And so those were supposed to take place last year. They're, this year, they're, they're now um, rescheduled for next year. And one of the things that UN Women wants to push for is that they end in some concrete commitments, not a new platform, but a series of action coalitions around specific themes, like women's economic rights or the women peace and security agenda where actors who are will willing to take that agenda forward and accelerate action come together to do so. 
And Silka, is this something, this uh, event that's been postponed until next year, is this something that the public could attend or is this more for a delegation, you know, governmental and NGO folks? So I think it's all still quite a bit uncertain because we're not even sure if we can actually have a presential sure. meeting. Yeah. Um, and, and there are different roles for, for different actors. So there are delegations, of course, um, but then um, I, I suppose that many of the events, if there were any, <laughs> yes. would be open to the public. And yeah. if they're streamed, they're definitely um, open to so we'll we will watch this space then for that <laughs> thank you very much valerie the next question goes to you uh your recent book the first political order discusses the relationship between men and women and the many forms of social organization that are based on this relationship how has this impacted the security of women and girls well thank you to whoever uh asked that question because it allows me to say a little bit more about our book um this book is is a really interesting book because not only is it kind of the culmination of my career as a scholar looking at the linkage between women's insecurity and national insecurity um, but it was also um, a, a major project of the u.s department of defense that gave us 1.3 million dollars to conduct the most comprehensive empirical investigation of how in it um what's going on with women affects what's going on in the nation state. Um, so we put forward, um, uh, you know, an assertion that I think has been made by uh, feminists for a very long time, is that the first political order in any society is actually the sexual political order. That is how the relationship between men and women are uh, imagined by the society. Uh, are these two groups representing roughly half of society um, is one a superior and one an inferior or are they equals what's the resource allocation between these two groups um, what's the typical conflict resolution uh, if these two groups disagree or representatives of the two groups disagree how's decision making for the group handled and I, I think we can see even from the the short array of statistics that um, Silke and I um, looked is that um, the first political order between men and women, even worldwide, is, is somewhat lopsided. And in some societies, it's extremely lopsided, uh, extremely favoring men um, over women. Uh, and so uh, we actually um, collected data on what we called 11 household subordinative practices, because our, um, our thesis is that it, it, it's really not levels of female literacy or female labor force participation or even female representation in legislatures that is the most accurate assessment of the level of women's empowerment in a society. Uh, it's in fact what's going on within the home and what is um, marriage custom and marriage law and property rights for women and so forth. So we looked at 11 um, practices that we we thought made in, in essence kind of a, a straitjacket for women ranging from levels of violence against women property rights polygyny bride price dowry sex ratio alteration um, patrilocal marriage you know a, a really unique kind of indicator of women's subordination and then we examined 122 different uh, national outcomes everything from uh, more famous indices such as the fragile states index and gdp per capita to other types of indexes looking at property rights and economic freedom and so forth and we found that uh in in over 70 percent of the um model runs that we did that is the each probing of the relationship and controlling for a whole host of other variables that this level of women's subordination was in fact the most significant and most determinative factor in these national outcomes. So our book tries to put forward and, and thankfully we were given the money ironically from, from the Defense Department to do it, uh, is, is that uh, women's subordination, especially at the household level, is an absolutely critical um, factor in understanding national security and, and governance worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I think that um, I, I'm going to be really eager to see the 11 household subordinative uh, factors in your book. Uh, and I'm struck by 
that because uh, we recently had a meeting at our fund and we had little breakout groups and we had as an icebreaker question, when did you first realize you were living in a patriarchy? And every single one of our answers in our breakout group was all about some message that we received or picked up in our family setting. So that's really fascinating. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you uh, to Brenda for asking that question. The next question we have actually goes to Kathleen. Kathleen, uh, the question is, do Massachusetts state legislators use the status of women reports in their work to develop policy and pass legislation? And if you know that's to be the case, would you know of any examples? So that's an excellent question. And our hope is always that people will use the data to inform the legislation they're developing and based on, um, on that data as well. Um, I will ask Donna maybe to, to share a little too, because we, um, again, so at the Women's Fund event, there were some state legislators who were there um, and spoke to the importance of the report. And I don't recall exactly um, who those legislators were. Um, I, I'm not sure how they've used it, but they did speak to the importance and that they would be using it. Um, so Donna, I don't know if you have more to add to that. Sure, Kathy and I uh, would love to just round out your great answer. And that is, yes, Senator Eric Lesser uh, and also State Representative Tricia farley Bouvier were both in attendance at that. And we made sure to send all of our elective representatives in Western Massachusetts copies of this report. And we also uh, took it upon ourselves to uh, do a roadshow of sorts to all of our regional commissions on the status of women. Uh, but in, in Massachusetts, uh, we, our state commission on the status of women is very underfunded. And so they don't have the resources to do a report, a statewide report on the status of women and girls. And so that's why it was very important for the Women's Fund to fill that gap and uh, create this report with the partnership of the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. So we would have this information and certainly one of our strategies was to arm our elected representatives with this information so that when they're going to Boston, Beacon Hill, where our um, legislative work happens, they would know uh, what the opportunities and challenges are that are faced by women and girls. Uh, so I think that the subtext to this really is it's so important for uh, women's foundations often to step in and do this work when the governmental bodies uh, aren't funding the work to happen itself. Um, so thank you for that question as well. And the next question that we had come in is for you, Valerie. And the question is, your research seems to point to the durability and power of cultural norms as the primary influencer of people rather than laws, education, and economics, and hence gender relations. Can you speak about any concrete examples of efforts to change cultural norms and in doing so improve the status of women? So I guess really kind of jumping off from your last comments about you know, there were these 11 household factors that you looked at. So what are your recommendations when you're seeing that straight jacket on women? What should we do about it? Oh, that's also a brilliant question. Clearly the attendees whom we, we panelists actually cannot see the attendees on our screen. So I'm imagining you are there and I'm imagining you are extremely intelligent um, attendees because these are great questions. Um, I will say uh, that we have an entire, we have three parts of the book and the entire last section is on the dynamics of change. So I just want to tell you that I've actually written a couple of hundred pages on how we can actually go about changing these things. Um, but um, in, in some cases, it's, it's not as, as difficult as we might think. So I think there's a, a sense in which there are, uh, there's some low hanging fruit um, that we can uh, tackle. Um, one low hanging fruit, I think, is child marriage. And child marriage for me is a hub issue around which a whole bunch of negative things grow. Uh, and so eradicating child marriage would probably do more for peace in this world than virtually anything else, including the export of democracy. Uh, and I think it's true that laws, the changes in laws are showing that there is a changing attitude towards uh, child marriage. Um, but it's, it's, you know, we've seen some really 
um, uh, amazing and impressive attempts at law enforcement. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with uh, this uh, amazing um, female chief in Malawi who summarily uh, annulled over 300 marriages because the girls were brides. Um, it, it takes, if you will, I think some leadership on this issue um, as, as well as the backing of law. Um, uh, and I think it also involves um, helping parents to see what the benefits are of allowing their children, their daughters to be married at, at a later age. In fact, um, the, the, the first section of the world that became abnormal in terms of some of these things was Northwestern Europe, which was also the birthplace of democracy and capitalism, if you will, the kinds of capitalism we talk about today. Uh, and uh, historians uh, assert that the, the, the one of the most important things that turned Northwestern Europe from um, the traditional path was in fact a higher age of marriage for girls. Uh, tax laws uh, during the dark ages um, actually rewarded farmers who kept their daughters home um, for several more years. So instead of the worldwide marriage pattern of pubescent girls of 12, 13, 14, think Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, marrying grooms who were 10 or 15 or 20 years older than them. What you see in Northwestern Europe is that the age of marriage for, for, for boys lessens somewhat and the age of marriage for girls increases drastically. So uh, at, the, at the threshold of, of the takeoff of democracy and capitalism, we have an average age of 22 for marriage of girls and an average age of 24 for marriage of boys. And the type of household that you create with a 22 and a 24 year old is vastly different than the household you create with a 13 year old girl and a 30 year old man, v vastly different. You change so much. But there are recent examples too. For example, Korea used to have one of the worst birth sex ratios and childhood sex ratios in the world. And one of the things that it did was it used law to dismantle um, a lot of the clan structure, giving uh, rights to property and, and surnames and so forth uh, to women. Uh, and in addition is they began to offer a pension system for the elderly. So rather than having to depend on sons, now they could depend on um, the government. And so the, the attitudes about the value of having a son is versus having a daughter came almost 180 degrees over the space of just 20 years with those kinds of interventions. So I don't think it's necessary to just wait till all the people have a mass conversion of the heart. I think there's smart things that we can do with law and with economic incentives and disincentives that can change attitudes in a shorter period of time. But that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for that great answer as well. And we actually have a question coming from our Facebook Live. Uh, one of our audience there is asking a question that I think probably Valerie and Silka are probably best positioned to answer. And the question is, what is the reason for the male population increase? Is it due to one child policies or female infanticide? Valerie, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, it's clearly sex selective abortion and female infanticide. People are not having more sons. They're choosing to have fewer daughters. Uh, and technology is making it possible to identify girl fetuses earlier and earlier. There is now a blood test which can be given to the mother at seven weeks of pregnancy to determine whether she is having a girl or a boy. Uh, and, and so in that case, you might not even have to go into a clinic for an abortion. I mean, there's, 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 there's now are you, uh, can't remember the numbers, um, where you can affect that abortion yourself. So it really is um, sex selective abortion. In some very poor areas, there is still female infanticide. There absolutely still is. Um, but sex selective abortion, uh, female ab abandonment, and so forth is, is also part of this. Thank you, Valerie. And Silka, is there anything you want to add to that? Or she's, is, has Valerie covered it pretty well? I think that's well covered. Um, if I may, I wanted to maybe add a little bit on the discussion around social norms because I Please. think um, that, that's also interesting. And it, 
And I think what's really important is um, to recognize that informal social norms and gender norms don't change overnight and they don't change in a vacuum. They're not unhinged from institutions. And I think Valerie has said that in a different way when she was talking about laws. Um, and, so, and so there is a possibility to use public policy and laws to influence um, social norms. And I mentioned maybe a bit too briefly in the presentation, the example of the experience of parental leaves now virtually across, you know, much of Europe, spearheaded by the Nordic countries, that you know started out with maternity leaves, but then added paternity leaves and then shared parental leaves, and all of that didn't quite make the big difference um, because women still took the bulk of the leave, and and um, the dynamics didn't change much. But but with these daddy quota which are additional months that are given to the family to take after childbirth within the first year or so, reserved for the father, we now see, you know, these are taken up because otherwise the family loses the two months altogether. And in the Nordic countries, time use surveys show that very slowly, this also translates into a greater participation of men in child rearing and domestic um, work and that some of that is sustained beyond that parental leave period. So I think that's another good example um, of, of how you know you can provide incentives and nudges to, to change things. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly say is that obviously another set of social norms is around precisely that you know women as caregivers, men as the breadwinners, and that is still very persistent. And it's not only in the home, it's also that we see that all the caregiving occupations in the labor market are not only feminized, but they're also paid much less. So in addition to the motherhood and the fatherhood penalty that I mentioned in the presentation, researchers have identified something called a care penalty. So with the same set of qualifications, with the same years of experience, if you work in a job that involves interaction with people and care for others, you take a wage cut for that work. And women are, are overrepresented in that work and that makes up a large share of the gender pay gap. And so a lot of attention has focused on getting more girls into STEM and getting girls into male dominated sectors. And I think all of that is really important, but I think it shouldn't divert attention from the fact that there's a real problem with how we value care for others in our societies also the workers who do that kind of work. And I think if COVID has provided one opportunity, it's to really put a spotlight on how essential that work is and that it really deserves labor rights, you know, collective organization rights um, and, and better wages. And I think with that, with, you know, again, it's laws and public policies, minimum wages, you know, for these kinds of workers that can send a very strong signal, you know, about how we value that kind of work. I love that, uh, Silka, because I think more and more we're seeing that here in Western Mass as well, that we just don't care enough for our care workers. And Kathleen, I'd love to pivot to you and see if you can add anything to that conversation as well. Yeah, no, it absolutely resonated with what we're hearing and seeing here in Western Mass and the discussion that's going on and an interest in, in those who are um, providing childcare. And so clearly very underpaid, doing a um, critical, important service in the healthy development of children. And so there's an interest um, in the discussion around some legislation to look at that, but it's just so incredibly hard to change. And so, um, and so I think that this is something that, um, again, has been brought up and legislators are interested in. And so, um, in addition, I, I, you know, some of the other areas, as you were speaking to that Silka as well, um, so teachers and, and child care and traditionally under um, health care in some areas and traditionally underpaid and, and work to um, increase pay for those areas as well. And um, speaking and thinking about the COVID and how that really has um, taken a toll on people who are working in these areas, but agree that there is definitely and hopefully an opportunity and we do see more people here paying more attention. So that's really important. 
And, and uh, thank you, Kathleen. And I think one of the other things that brings to mind as well is uh, how often uh, in, at least at the US, we see uh, with the childcare workers, for instance, that there's legislation passed to uh, make sure that they have greater educational levels when they're working with our youngest, uh, but they don't make sure that they're getting paid more to compensate for that extra educational level. And also, interestingly, as well, you know, you see with a lot of the school systems, you have the power of unions uh, coming to uh, the front and sort of pushing remote schooling. Uh, where it's safer for teachers and kids, uh, there is not that uh, counterbalance in terms of early childcare workers. They don't have that powerful union. So I think some of what Silka and Kathleen, you just said, um, we see that right on the ground as well. Another question I have for all of you, and perhaps Kathleen, maybe you could answer this first from your perspective and what you've seen in the data here is the maternal mortality rate uh, that Valerie was talking about. It's great that it's gone, uh, you know, the mortality rate's gone down, less women are dying in childbirth, but yet we see in the U.S. Uh, for sure in, with Black women, we see that those rates, uh, even though we're a very advanced country in terms of healthcare, we don't see good uh, outcomes for Black women with maternal mortality rates. So if you all could comment on that, Kathleen, if you want to go first, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I, didn't, I didn't speak to that, but in, in general, in Massachusetts, maternity, maternal mortality rates have gone down and they're fairly low. Um, in our region, we do see much higher rates. And I know I'm familiar with the rates in Springfield where it's much higher amongst African-American women. And there's been a number of efforts to try and think about how to address um, the um, the, these high mortality rates and provide, um, provide ad additional services. And it's not clear if, if some of this is related to um, the institution and um, there, some of what um, some focus groups have shown that there's um, concern and feeling like um, people are treated differently of color as they go into prenatal care and in the um, system as a whole. And um, also just in terms of culturally appropriate um, interventions and some of the different strategies being considered um, are community doulas and people who um, are of the community and um, are culturally representative. So in this case, thinking about African-American doulas who could work in the community and reach out to women sooner. I think there's just a number of challenges and it's been something that there's been a focus on locally for a while and it's just been really challenging to identify um, solutions and ways to really um, to address that. There's been, there's been some improvement, but there's more and more needs to be done. Thank you, Kathleen. And Silka, do you have anything to add uh, from the UN's perspective? I don't have um, much to add to the situation in the US. You all know, know that much better than I do probably. But um, again, you know, it's not a single country phenomenon. We see that you know, women, and, uh, women from minority ethnic and racial groups and women from low income groups and women, you know, gender diverse and, 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 and with different sexual orientations, you know, face, face some of these specific challenges. And that can go from, you know, an indigenous women in Bolivia being, you know, 20 miles away from the next health post, but also facing real discrimination if and when she goes there. So she may even be choosing to have her child at home and thereby um, run a greater risk. But I think apart from these things, there's also a broader um, pattern of, you know, these groups already experiencing, you know, discrimination and hardship in everyday life. So, you know, when the women are pregnant and have to work until, I think actually that's a thing in the U.S. as well, right? Because maternity leave is not really a reality for many women. That, you know, but, but we know it from the indigenous women, for example, who then have to do very hard manual labor until the day they, they, they bear their children. 
that obviously has a bearing on 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 maternal health and and the maternal mortality risk. But I think it's an interest. It's a it's a confluence of factors that um, that really increases the risk among among those groups. Mm -hmm. And Valerie, anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, this is something that um, strikes me here in, in, in Texas as being a very huge problem, is that maternal mortality rates uh, among um, black mothers is, are, are like five times um, that of others. Uh, and so uh, this has been something that we've kind of been thinking about here in Texas. And uh, in addition to the, the types of things that Kathleen is, is talking about, um, we're also looking at things like um, getting the maternal mortality statistics right. So, for example, um, uh, it, it's actually state law that tells you what counts as a maternal mortality death. Uh, and so, um, in, in many states, it, it's, um, it's within uh, 30 days of birth um, may count. But we, we found that a lot of these deaths are actually happening out to 60 days. Uh, or, or even further than 60 days. So, so part of really documenting what's going on, I think, is to, is, is to take a look at even how we define maternal mortality and how we count it. Um, but I think a lot of the things that Kathleen and, and Silka were talking about are, are also important. Um, especially important is in you know, um, facilitating women in accessing prenatal care. Um, is is key, and yet we know that that many um, women um, may have to work, and so they're not going to be able, perhaps, to get the type of prenatal care they have, or perhaps they don't have the transportation to get where they need to get to. So I think facilitating prenatal care is is a, is key uh, as well. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so we're coming up close to the end of our time, and I'd love to pose one last question to all three of you before we wind up. And um, my question, um, probably I'll start with Silka, because you had a comment in our uh, pre-conversations to this conversation um, that really struck me, and it was that you said that women are running to stand still. Um, because the gain, many of the gains we are making are so precarious and, as Valerie pointed out, so easily pushed back. Uh, so my question to each of you would be, if you had a magic wand and could change one thing uh, over these next 25 years, let's say, what would that one thing be that you would pick? And Silka, um, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going to have you go first. <laughs> I love these questions. You're like, I want a magic wand and then my wishes, can I please have a hundred more wishes, right? Because there are just so many things to do. But um, I think maybe coming back to some of the previous discussion that we've had on the pandemic, what I would really like to see is governments use the massive crisis and mess that we're in to drive transformation forward. At a, at a big scale. So use the fiscal stimulus packages that you are pouring into the economies to please you know, steer those economies on a more sustainable path, make them greener, make them more inclusive of women, make them more, you know, create more and better jobs, including in the care sector and make sure these workers are paid decently. These are green jobs and they're jobs that contribute to human development. So I would really like to see kind of a drive to, to not um, call it a recovery. That's the kind of, we've had this discussion in our team lately, because a recovery means you're going back to where you, you were before. And you know, as we've seen in the presentations by you know, both Valerie, um, you know, by all of us really, um, is that that's not really the desirable situation we want to go back to. We want to see much more systemic and, and profound and lasting change. So, um, and oftentimes I think, you know, history shows that these crises, you know, can be turning points. Things can get much worse and, um, you know, things can get much better. So hedging my bets on the latter. <laughs> Okay, so we know what uh, Silka's one wish is. Valerie, how about you? What, what, what would be your thought? Oh, you've already heard it. Child marriage. 
Okay. All right, give me a magic wand and let me eliminate child marriage worldwide and then let's see what happens. I bet okay. you lots of wonderful things will happen from that point. <laughs> That's awesome. So Kathleen, on to you. Yeah. So um, along the lines of what Silka was saying, I think um, thinking about the opportunity and, and the resources being poured in to um, address what we're seeing with COVID and other areas, I think with the um, energy that has arisen with the recent deaths in, in Black Lives Matter, the horrific deaths that have happened in DC, the energy amongst young people and, and young women and others and really I think to see that that this energy that's happening related to the inequities from COVID and inequities from um, the recent deaths as well to see that make change and it, it feels like it, there is um, there there may be a potential for a shift and so um, it's been really um, exciting and empowering to see young women step up and and play um, a leadership role and take a voice in, in what's going on. Yes, definitely. And I agree with all of your comments. Uh, and I especially agree, Silka, that recovery is not the word that should be used. It's, it's time for a reset. And so you're right. We should be using this crisis as an opportunity, apparently in Chinese. The word crisis also means opportunity. So uh, let's go with the Chinese definition and use this as an opportunity. So um, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you uh, for all the work you put into your presentations, all the work you do every day uh, for women and girls and your research. It's really making a difference. Uh, we all very much appreciate the work that you're doing and the time that you have given us today uh we're very grateful and we're very grateful for the data and the research and valerie i look forward to reading your book for sure and silka i look forward to uh diving further into your re report as well and kathleen of course we look forward to continued partnership uh, i also want to thank the committee the team that has brought this event to you today we have been so lucky to have brenda opperman and debbie opperman on our team uh, we've been at this for over a year. Uh, we got together and started talking about how might we mark this anniversary of the Beijing Conference, which as you all now know, uh, really was the origin of the idea for our Women's Fund. And Sheila Levante, who's one of our board members and who's been sort of the tech guru for today, uh, really hopped on board and made this happen. And Kelly Bryant on our team has also been the behind the scenes uh, tech guru as well as the marketing uh, person. So she's been live tweeting and uh, emailing with all of you and sending last minute links. So thank you to you all. This, this event would not happen without all of your work and your great ideas. So thank you to you all. One great way to support progress for women and girls is to support the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts, and we invite you to do that if you're able. And if you are joining us from across the, uh, the nation or across the world, find your local Women's Foundation and support it because it's doing great work to support local women and girls. And often it, it gets uh, overlooked. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed with COVID uh, funding is that you know, women's foundations sometimes have been overlooked, but yet they can be such a great solution. So thank you for all of your support today. And as one of our speakers pointed out, our gains are often tenuous. And so we need everyone in this fight uh, against gender subordination. And we appreciate everything uh, and everyone for tuning in today. We will be sharing a recording of today's conversation. We're not exactly sure quite how to do that. So you will be receiving an email if you registered and we will send uh, you information about that and you can reply if you would like to have uh, a recording of this and our Facebook users will probably be putting something on that platform. So uh, watch that space as well. And I wanna make a special thank you to Diane Doherty who I know is watching and I believe Martha Richards is watching as well. Thank you for uh, going to Beijing and coming back so inspired to create the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. It's our pleasure to carry the torch for you and continue to improve the lives of women and girls in Western Massachusetts. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>